who am I? Why am I here? Those were the unintentionally comical opening lines of Admiral James Stockdale in the 1992 US vice presidential debate. Now, he was roundly mocked for asking these questions with the view that if he didn't know what the answers were, he was certainly unlikely to be enlightened by the audience. But I want to flip the tables. I want to ask you, who are you? Why are you here? So we'll come back to the first question, but I want to start with the second one. Why are you here this evening? Hopefully you haven't been coerced or kidnapped or otherwise forced to come here under duress, uh, that you, you, you decided instead to come under your own free will. So maybe you saw an announcement about the talks, you looked at the content, thought that they sounded interesting, and actively decided to come. But did you decide to find them interesting? Did you decide to be the type of person who would find them interesting? Does any of us decide to be the type of person we are, to be the way we are? Well, not really. In many, many ways, our behavior is constrained by things that are outside of our control. So first of all, we all come with a general human nature that has been wired into us by evolution, millions and millions of years of evolution. So, for example, we have common instincts that we don't control. We don't choose to find babies cute. We don't choose to be afraid of the dark, to like to spend time with other people, to be angry when we're hungry, or hundreds of other things are pre-wired, pre-set into our brain. That's just the way that we come, and they're there for a reason. Those are adaptive. Those have helped to keep us alive, uh, and more importantly, they help to keep your ancestors alive and reproducing, and therefore they were passed on to you. And in addition to our, our general human nature, we all have individual natures that are somehow variations on that theme. So as our brains develop, there's, there's a program in the human genome that encodes the way that they develop. It encodes the program to make a human brain. But my program is slightly different from yours, which is slightly different from yours. We all have our own version, and so the outcome is different between all of us. And in fact, on top of that, there's random variation in how that process actually plays out. The genome doesn't encode the final outcome. It encodes just a set of biochemical processes and rules whereby the organism self-assembles, including its brain. But those rules and processes are subject to noise at a molecular level. So there's some inherent random variability in the way that that program plays out. So even in identical twins, whose genome is 100% identical, by the time that they're born, they're already quite distinct from each other, the structure of their brain, in the function of their brain, and in their psychological predispositions. So we all have our own innate predispositions that, that come wired in, whether we're shy or outgoing, whether we're cautious or reckless, anxious or carefree, impulsive or deliberate. All of those things are wired into our brains in a way that affects our decision making. In fact, that's by definition really what personality traits are. They're patterns of decision-making in, in any given situation. So we may have, at a very deep level in our brains, circuits that control things like how sensitive we are to threats, how sensitive to risks, whether we, we feel rewards or punishment more or less keenly, whether we weight long-term goals versus short-term goals um, heavily or not. And all of those things manifest as influences on our decision-making in any given situation in ways that we recognize as these character traits, neuroticism, extroversion, conscientiousness, and so on. So our decision-making is constrained literally by the way our brain is wired. Now, we have our, our evolved general nature. We have our individual nature that depends on how our brain develops. And then, on top of that, of course, we learn from experience. So, when we're experiencing the world, we're forming memories of our past, associations between events and objects in the environment, and especially a record of the good or bad outcomes of our actions. All of that gets wired into our neural circuitry in a way that then informs our subsequent decisions. It leaves a literal imprint on the physical structure of our brains. So our past, over our own lifetime, as we were developing in the womb, and even our ancestral past as a, as a species, strongly shapes our character and our habits and informs and constrains the choices that we make or that we even consider making. Now, 
if that's the case, can we say that our will is truly free? Well, one, by one definition, if we're not coerced by something external to us, if there's no external cause that's forcing us to do something, then we can say we're free, we're doing something. But on the other hand, there's another way to think about it. If there's some cause, some physical cause that you're not in control of, even if it's inside your brain, in the physical structure of your brain, well, then you could argue that you are being influenced by something outside your control. So you're not really in charge, your brain is. And now, what you think about that, what you think about that idea, depends on your conception of you, of yourself. Now, George W. Bush, I know, remember him? He doesn't seem so bad now. <laughs> he used to call himself the decider-in-chief. So his various secretaries and generals and civil servants would present him with some options, and he would decide on them. But he didn't decide what options were presented to him. He didn't know anything about that or lots of other things. He was blissfully unaware of all of the considerations that went into limiting those options. But he really did make decisions, and we really do make decisions, hopefully better ones. And like him, we, our conscious selves, are blissfully unaware of most of the work that goes into offering us those options to choose from. So if our brain basically has, has incorporated our past experiences, and based on that, suggests to us some options. And that's just as well. If we had to think every decision through from first principles, if our brain had no habits or heuristics to base that on, we'd be paralyzed by indecision. If we see this and think to ourselves, hmm, what should I do in this scenario? I will consciously deliberate on all of my... <laughs> you'd be lunch. Okay? And, and throughout the course of, of, of every day, most of the decisions that we make, the actions that we take, are on cognitive autopilot. And that's good. That's a good thing. Because if we were deciding things without those prior constraints, if we were really completely free to do things with no prior cause, then we'd also be doing things for no reason. We don't want to be doing things for no reason. We want to be doing things for our reasons. In fact, doing things for our reasons is the essence of selfhood. So much so that when people act dramatically out of character, we recognize that as, as a sign, as a symptom of psychiatric or neurological disease like schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease, which are characterized by a dissolution of the self. And in fact, the continuity of yourself over time, the whole essence of you being you, absolutely depends on, is entailed by your actions being informed by your personality and your past experiences. And if that is accomplished by embodying those physical criteria as constraints in the physical structure of your brain so your conscious mind doesn't have to think about that, well, great, fine, that's a super efficient way of running things. You're just delegating a lot of the, the decision-making work to your non-conscious part of your brain. So it, it's a bit like the, the recommender systems in Netflix or Amazon. So these do a lot of deep learning to analyze the patterns in your past choices. And then they'll predict what you want to do. They'll predict something that you might want to watch or something that you might want to buy. They're really good at it. Well, your brain is like that as well. It's done a lot of deep learning to figure out th the, the patterns of your behavior. So it knows that in a given situation, you like to do X. And in another situation, you like to do Y. And that's what it's going to suggest to you that you do. And it's really good at it, too. It's better than you, because it is you. So ultimately, even if you're not consciously aware of them, all of those constraints are still part of you. It's precisely those things that define yourself. So we make a mistake. It's a seductive intuition, but it's a mistake to identify ourselves just with the highest conscious level of our minds. You're not just the voice in your head that you think with, or that you think you think with. Your brain has done lots of thinking already. It's done all that deep learning in the course of your past experiences. It's embedded all of that knowledge into the structure of your brain 
so that you don't have to think about it again in every, in every new scenario. So you're not just the, the Netflix consumer, you're also the recommender system. You're not just the decider in chief, you're the whole system of government. Ultimately, there is no ghost in the machine. The ghost is the machine. Thank you.